welcome Hoosier fans to another victorious episode of the Assembly Call as tonight your Indiana Hoosiers defeat the Nebraska Cornhuskers 89-64 to on just one of the most really surreal nights to be a sports fan that we've had in a long time. It was a very difficult game to try to concentrate on with so much news coming out from the start of the game to the end with the NBA suspending their season and just everything that has gone on today. So it has absolutely been a crazy day. We're obviously going to cover that later in the show, but we are going to start out, of course, by talking about this game because the Hoosiers did win, as I said, by 25 points. The win clinches Indiana's first 20-win season under Archie Miller, their first Big Ten tournament win under Archie Miller, and if there is a selection Sunday, which certainly doesn't seem like a guarantee at this point, uh, it'll be the first time that Indiana feels good about its chances to make the NCAA tournament heading into selection Sunday. So, you know, this was a really important game for Indiana to not lose, you know, against an undermanned Nebraska team. Although, I, you know, I give I, I tip my cap to Nebraska. Those guys played hard, uh, you know, given all the challenges that they're dealing with, including apparently their coach being ill on the sidelines. I thought they put up a pretty valiant effort just for two undermanned to really mount a serious challenge in the second half to Indiana and the Hoosiers took care of business, which was good. All right, I'm your host, Jared Morris. I'm here with Andy Bottoms, here with the coach, Brian Tonsoni. We're going to break it all down for you on this edition of the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. Certainly spend a lot of time at the beginning talking about the game itself, but we will get to some of the news of the day and how that it could potentially affect Indiana moving forward. But let's start this show the way that we start every show. That is with our Hoosier Proud Banner Moment. And for the Banner Moment, I'm going to go back to the first half when, if you'll recall, the game hung in the balance late in the first half. Nebraska leading 33-29 to at the under four-minute timeout. And through the first 16 minutes of this game, Indiana had basically played one good four-minute stretch in between the under-16 and under-12-minute timeouts. And outside of that, Nebraska really dictated pace. Uh, you know, they were getting Indiana back door. They were getting open threes. Indiana's defense really just was not functioning on all cylinders. And so they come out of that timeout. Momentum is on Nebraska's side. A lot of Indiana fans are feeling, you know, is this going to be another Big Ten tournament disaster? Rob and Al are both on the bench with two fouls. Who's going to step up? And the guy that stepped up was Indiana senior Devontae Green, who delivered, I thought, one of the best three or four minute stretches of his career at the end of the first half. And I know that seems like hyperbole, especially for a guy who has just, you know, gone nuclear from a three point shooting perspective. But I thought this was one of the best stretches because it was driven by his passing and his defense more than just his shot making. You know, he came out right of the, right out of the gates and made a two pointer, which was big. But then the next time down the court on defense, he got a big rebound. He pushed it in transition, drove into the lane, got it out to Armand Franklin, who drained a three. And boy, does anybody like shooting in Banker's life more than Armand Franklin? Uh, and that came right after the graphic about Rob and Al having two fouls. So you know, Indiana's two guards there stepped up. Then on the next possession, Durant, uh, Devontae got it into Duran for a bucket. Then Devontae hit a three to punctuate it. So coming out of that timeout, a 9-0 run for Indiana, five points, two assists for Devontae, plus good defense and rebounding. It pushed Indiana's lead up eventually to 41-34. They led it the half, and then they would push it out in the second half, extend that lead, and obviously win by, you know, by 25 points. But I thought that stretch when the game hung in the balance, someone needed to step up. It was Devontae but not in the way that he usually steps up with just making a bunch of shots. He made the shots, but I thought his decision-making, his passing, his defense was as good for a short stretch of basketball as we've seen it. Granted, he ended that stretch by doing a heat check from about 30 feet. He is Devontae after all, and he missed that shot, but I thought all the decisions he made before that to bring Indiana back were really important, really good decisions. So good stretch there by Devontae Green. All right, our banner moment tonight, as always, brought to you by our friends at Home Field Apparel, a company that was founded by an IU grad that remains based in Indianapolis. They have over 70 different schools available on their website. And what they do with all these schools is they go and they find unique logos, unique brand marks that you know haven't been used for 20, 30, sometimes 50, 60 years. They get the licensing form, they pull them back. And they give you the opportunity for your school of choice to really find a unique way to show your love for your school. So if you're an Indiana fan, that means the Bison logo. That means the Script Indiana shirt, the new Script Hoosier shirt, the old Indiana basketball shoes logo. I could go on and on. They have so many different, interesting, unique logos there on their website. Plus, all their materials are really comfortable. So the short sleeve tee, the long sleeve tee, the crew neck sweater, the hoodie, whatever you get, it's comfortable the moment you get it. It's comfortable after you wash it. That's why you need to go to homefieldapparel.com and get your IU gear for yourself, 
as a present. And hey, if you have friends or family members who went to other schools, look at all the other schools they have because they're going to probably have something that that friend or family member likes as well. And when you do that, load up your shopping cart and then get 20% off the entire order when you use the promo code ASSEMBLY20. That's ASSEMBLY20 at checkout for 20% off your entire order. Go to homefieldapparel.com today. Get the most unique and comfortable IU apparel that you will find anywhere. All right. Well, it is time to move the ball, find the open man, and get some opening thoughts from the rest of our team. And we will start with Count Andy Bottoms. Andy, your bottoms line on this Indiana victory. Uh, I mean, like you said, just a weird, really weird night all around. Uh, from a, a basketball perspective, this was, in a lot of ways, the uh, the quintessential performance for this IU team where you would see moments of brilliance. You would see them completely relax when they got into situations that they could you know, potentially put their foot on the throat of the opponent, let them back in the game with some just moments of casual play, whatever. So it was, you know, ultimately just a, a lot of the same things that we've seen from this team over the course of the year. It just felt like they could turn it on. They knew they could turn it on whatever they needed to. I think that was really the case even in the first segment before the media timeout. It was 14-13. Nobody really playing a lot of defense. But it was fairly clear even at that point that IU was going to be able to score whenever they – they felt like it uh, against Nebraska. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know how much, given Nebraska's personnel and all the situations you take from the game, I, certainly from a bracketology perspective, it was a game that uh, would have hurt IU a lot more to lose than it helps to win. Uh, but it, it certainly helps them just a little bit, just in terms of, you know, picking up another victory uh, and, and and those kinds of things. And, and I thought, you know, a few bright spots in here, I'm sure we'll talk about Ar- Armand Franklin more. I know you mentioned him. Uh, even when the game got down to 10 in the second half, I thought he stepped up, made a couple big plays, drove and got a couple free throws, hit a three, drew a couple charges that were, uh, if those had been called against IU, I probably would have been irate about, but in this case, I was, I was okay with it. So, um, he, he was a guy that Archie came into the game saying would get a lot of run, um, and, and did in large part because of foul trouble early, but I thought he played well. And, uh, so, you know, good building block for a guy like that. If you want to spin this forward to whatever next season looks like, regardless of whether IU makes a tournament this year or not, you can uh, at least kind of see some foundational things from him. So uh, an odd game for a variety of reasons, but uh, they got done what they needed to get done. And, um, you know, as I I said in the chat, sounds like the Nebraska players are not coming to the post-game press conference. Uh, One can only assume that. They're actually keeping everybody away from the Nebraska locker room. because of how Fred Hoiberg looked during the game, which is uh, really just kind of adding fuel to the fire of the other stuff. So this will be an odd post-game show for sure, as I'm sure we're going to get more information as we go. Yeah, I mean, it. I'm sure you guys feel the same. It feels a little odd talking about the game just with all this stuff going around. And obviously the number one thing that we all hope is that everybody's just okay and healthy and all of those things. You know, I mean, obviously we, we will talk about the game, but so much going on right now, uh, you know, and not just inside of sports, but obviously in the world. So, uh, coach, let's go over to you. It is Tonsoni time. Your thoughts. You know, I will piggyback on both of you. I, I thought the guard play was really outstanding today, and, and the game of basketball is about guards. We all love big guys, and, and nothing against Brunk and Trace Jackson Davis and Deron Davis. They played well, and you know Trace Jackson Davis had 16 rebounds. But the game of basketball has to be uh, played by uh, guards, and the offense needs to be run by a good point guard, and you need to have wings who can shoot the basketball. And you know, this is a Nebraska team that's not very good, so those things should happen, and they did happen. It, it, I'm not sure it's something to really get excited about, uh, like Indiana's turned the corner or anything, just because of the competition level. But facing, uh, it, it was a pressure situation, and I thought Indiana was okay offensively, maybe a little tight defensively to start. Uh, Nebraska was a lot more uh, into the game earlier, I thought, and then once Indiana got going, they, they found uh, – you know, they found what they needed to be, to be able to stretch it out there at the end of the first half. I really thought the start of the second half was really key to get up to 12 or 13 and eventually get it up to 18 because I, I knew every game there's another run. And, and it doesn't mean that Indiana's not playing well or, or whatever. It's frustrating from our vantage point. But there's going to be a run where they hit two shots in a row and, and Indiana misses. And, and that happened from a 20-point lead or a 21-point lead back down to 10. And, and a lot of times teams can't sustain – a run big enough to come back 21-22, and as we saw, Indiana was able to push it back out. But guard play is the key to the game tomorrow. Uh, guard play is the key to any tournament te- games, shot making, passing, and not turning the ball over. And after the first 10 minutes, I thought the guard play was really outstanding, especially when you have foul trouble and elect to sit your guys 
uh, for, with two fouls, uh, Armand and, and Devontae stepped up and played a lot better than they had in the past. So that's what I'm happy about. Uh, right now boy that silly strategy of sitting guys with two fouls sure does work well when <laughs> the guys that you put in for them come in and play as well as Armand and, and Devante did now I would like to linger on uh, on the topic of Armand for just a moment uh, you know leading the team in scoring uh, his plus minus was 32 tonight and we always talk about the limitations of that in a single game scenario so that's why putting context on it is important you know, his was 32 in a 25-point game no one else on the team was more than 23 what that tells you is during almost all the streaks when Indiana was playing really well tonight, Armand was out there. And it, you know, it wasn't always that he was making the crispest, cleanest basketball plays. You know, he had a couple of passes that were really bad. You know, he, he had a, a couple of turnovers. Um, you know, he, he's still kind of working out some of the skill things. But I thought what he brought from the moment he stepped on the court was energy and toughness. And, you know, sometimes that's what you need for God. Now, obviously, he's at Banker's Life, so he made three of five from downtown. You know, the basketball plays came, but I thought what he brought early, even when he was struggling, was the effort and the toughness, the charges. You know, I thought uh, I was going to save this for meaningful moments, but I think it's too important. I want to bring it up now is in the first half, he missed a three on the wing and he sprinted back. It was on the right wing. He sprinted back to the left block and took a charge. That's the kind of stuff that we haven't seen that often this season, you know? And I thought that kind of play was just indicative of the mindset he brought, and he ended up being rewarded, you know, because, again, the stats and all that stuff came around, finished with 13 points, eight rebounds, three assists, just a a, a really nice effort from him. You know, and Archie talked in the pregame, Coach, about how Armand was probably going to play more, but he kind of said it within the context of Devontae being hurt and not knowing how much Devontae would play. Well, Devontae played 19 minutes and looked pretty good. Armand kept playing, A, because of the foul trouble, and B, because he earned it, you know, just with energy. And I think as a coach, especially with a young player, you'll live with a guy making some mistakes skill-wise if you know you're getting every ounce of his heart and energy. And I thought, boy, that was just so obvious. You know, Armand just kind of had a different gear, and it kind of felt to a certain extent like other guys kind of caught up with him. Like, I, I just, I really thought he brought it. I was really impressed with him tonight. I agree, and the thing that's really pleasing to see is he hasn't been getting a lot of run lately, and, and he was ready when his number was called. That's what you want from Indiana Hoosiers, to understand your role, not to like your role. I'm sure he didn't like not playing, but he stuck with it, uh, and there was a time after the Purdue, after the, in the four-game losing streak, where we all co- were questioning the team chemistry and was the coach reaching the players, were the players shutting off the coaches, and I saw this when Armand hit a shot. I saw Devontae stand up, and I saw Rob Finnessy stand up and dance on the sidelines, and I always watch for sideline behavior, good and bad, and boy, that spoke volumes that they're rooting for the fourth guard who hadn't played a lot to come in and do well, and... and I don't. That's not going to guarantee a win against Penn State tomorrow. But that is that tells me the program wasn't as in desperation as I thought it was February eighth with a coach and players fighting each other and no one happy. Uh, I think they go. They may maybe went through a stretch of that. But he kept his cool when he wasn't playing, and he's ready to play. And Armand Franklin was just a bright spot uh, for me, as was Devontae, as you guys have mentioned in the, in the banner moment and early on. Those two really, really were, were pleasing to see, and I thought Rob did some nice things, and I think Al, after a shaky start, came back. So, yeah, um, I'm really happy for, for Armand uh, to get back in the flow of things and, and to have a good game. Yeah. Um, sorry, I was just reading a note about what's going on with the, uh, the Nebraska team. Um, again, sorry, back on, it's, it's just, it's crazy trying to watch. I'm going to, what I am going to be interested to see is what they do with the Indiana team. And, you know, if there's any type of quarantine that happens there, cause we saw that with the Oklahoma city, Utah game, uh, that got stopped. Um, but let's keep talking about this game. Um, you know, I thought Andy, I want to talk about trace Jackson Davis, you know, who I thought, you know, we, you know, kind of looked at some of his numbers and wrote an article this week about how much more successful Indiana has been when he's gotten, you know, shots and kind of gotten that requisite 12, 13, 14 shot attempts. You know, today he only got 10 shot attempts. A big part of that was that Nebraska was really selling out to try to keep him from getting the ball, but, you know, had 17 rebounds, four blocks. It wasn't the greatest offensive day for him, but he really, I thought, persisted on the glass persisted working hard to try and get open and kind of found some opportunities. And I thought Indiana stayed committed during good stretches to getting the ball inside. When they were playing poorly in the first half, they kind of started jacking shots and forgot about that. But, 
you know, he didn't get to the 12 or 13, but I thought they did kind of stay persistent trying to get him the ball against a defense that was selling out to not let him get it. And frankly, that just didn't have the horses to really stick with him for the entire game. Um, but definitely impressed with what he did rebounding wise. Yeah, that was uh, you know really about, I don't know, maybe it was midway through the, the first half. I think right around, I use outside of that last stretch, they only, they had won, I think the media second or the segment between media timeouts at 16 and 12 minutes. And they played pretty well then. And I think, not long after that, uh, Nebraska came out, played that zone, really, really, really packed it in and and just kind of dared IU to try to get him the ball. And I thought even at times when he wasn't scoring, IU was able to get decent threes uh, when they would when they would get the ball inside and then and then try to kick it back out. But there were too many times during that stretch where they just didn't really even make the effort to get the ball inside. But in general, you know, he really stayed engaged, did some things defensively. Um, the, the way that Nebraska plays really – regardless of their personnel, I think this, some of the guys they don't have now exaggerated it more is really just trying to space you out for him. It was at at times, who's he going to guard and struggled a little bit in those scenarios, but recovered well to block some shots. And um, I I thought did a good job of staying engaged, run, ran the floor. Well, uh, so many of the things that we're, we're used to from him. So yeah, it was um, as you said, the stretches that IU played best were the ones when they were the most insistent upon getting him, the ball and trying to get the ball inside. Um, and, and they struggled at times when they just settled uh, for shots uh, other than that. Well, we have a special surprise here on the IU Nebraska post game show. Players finding every wrinkle he hasn't ever Look who is here. The man himself, Ryan Phillips calling in from New York city. Is that where you are? I, I am. I mean, I'm in our, our work offices in New York city and uh, just got to watch the game. Uh, Your hey, audio is hey, awful. Just so I, you know. I, I sincerely apologize. I'm calling in from my phone. But, you know, <laughs> it's this is this is, this reminds us of a a time gone by when we used to have to do the show. Uh, but uh, look at us, all four of us together. You know, I know it's happy. That's why I called in. I, yeah. I heard you guys doing the show. I had it actually on in the office, and I wanted to call in and and do it. But I just wanted to say it's a big. Uh, I don't want to say a big win, but a big non-loss for Indiana. Like, I felt like they really came through when they needed to. Armand Franklin, uh, Trace Jackson Davis, great to see the freshmen really do some work. So, I, I, again, I don't want to be on here too long. My audio or, or the connection is too horrible. But I just wanted to, to chime in and, and, and say a big uh, move forward for Indiana. And what in what might be the last game without fans, the rest of the year for for college basketball so kind of a big event and and i'm glad that indiana stepped up to the plate and, and won a game that obviously they should have won but but really nice that they they actually stepped up and did it game ball to josh in the chat mob ryan loves to interrupt so much that he had to interrupt the show and he's not right? even supposed to be on <laughs> Apparently, while well, locked in a closet somewhere, and you know. yeah, it's look, it's right here. I'm actually in a closet. Like it's no, uh, it, yeah. I'm in our offices, and there, there's. By the way, there was nobody here in our offices all day because they've suspended people from coming into the office. So literally, we've been here all night. Yeah. and there are legitimate closets. It, that's that's a closet right there. That's a closet, folks. So it looks as it is. Um, but I, I did want to call in because I thought it was a big deal. And I think that Indiana, uh, I'm not the bracketologist of the group, as you all know, but I, I felt like it was nice to see them show up and, and win a game. Let's face it, they could lose uh, and, and expect to, to be put in a good situation. So I, I you know, it was, I'm excited. I, I thought that it was nice to see them come through when they needed to. And this team has done that a few times this year. Uh, it's fallen short at times it should have. At other times, so you know it was nice to see them come through and and uh, and finally put that behind them. And uh, we'll see. The rest of this season is going to be really weird. Uh, uh, we've been yeah. writing about it all day at the big lead. It's going to be a really odd rest of the way. But it was nice to see Indiana come through when he needed to. Yeah, if there is a season, which is, which really is You're right, which really is a legitimate. Like I know people are going to say, like that's alarmist, like. The way that this has trended for the past ten it's, hours, it's a legitimate question if the if the, the Big Ten tournament games will be played tomorrow. Like that I is mean, a question. 
and, and some of you guys know like what I do for a living and we follow, we track sports. It's a big lead all day. And, and I, I walked into the office at nine o'clock and I genuinely, when we walked out to get dinner at five o'clock, we had gone from one situation to a completely different situation. The world was different by the end of the day. And there's so few yeah. days where you could say the world is legitimately different and the world is different now, whether it's alarmist or not. There's a legitimate thing going on where things are trending yeah. in a different direction. And and so uh, we'll see what happens. I hope they have the NCAA tournament just because, you know, with limited fans, obviously they're going to do it that way. But limited people, I mean, obviously no fans. Uh, but I hope they do have it. But, it's, I mean, we're in a different world now than we were this morning. And, and I, I, again, let's say they cancel it tomorrow. At least IU went out playing the way they they needed to in this game and I know it's trivial given what's going on but I was certainly happy about it and and uh there were people here rooting for me because a loss to Nebraska with two football players off the street on the bench would have been would have been real rough and tough to stomach so we won a big 10 tournament game that is never trivial that is never trivial Archie got that Archie got that monkey off his back one of the most undermanned teams in the big 10 in the last five years but he beat him in the big 10 tournament we will take Look, it. I don't want. We again, will take you guys, it. You guys are doing a great show. I don't want to take away from it. I just wanted to pop on and say that, and 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 say hi to everybody, and and let you know that I'm in New York, which is essentially a petri dish right now. Uh, but I'm heading home tomorrow, and hopefully won't won't you know and be patient zero for the West Coast. But someone a- someone asked if you're buzzing in the chat. No, not buzzing. Okay. Not at all. I'm just excited. I can't. I can't. You know, I can't be excited about maybe you, a win. You do seem especially happy right now. I, it rarely happens. That's why they call it Ryan's rant. But I'm actually in a good mood right now. Uh, uh, okay. Love you guys, and uh, good luck with the rest of the show. Hey, safe travels. Seriously, hey, get home. Will happen. Get home right, soon. Later, guys. Okay. See you, man. Bye. Um, all right. Let's break and go to segment two. You guys good with that? Yep. Okay. Let's do it. Uh, all right, so coming up here as we continue our breakdown of Indiana's 25-point victory over Nebraska, we will point out tonight's meaningful moments that you might have missed, and then we will go inside the numbers to highlight the most important statistical notes from the game, including a really impressive slash shocking one from the first half. You're listening to the Assembly Call. Stick with us. Hi, this is James Blackman Jr. I never miss an open three, and I never miss an episode of The Assembly Call. Join Jared, Andy, Ryan, and Coach after every IU basketball game. Go Hoosier. Thank you, James. He delivered one of the best Wednesday night Big Ten tournament performances uh, in history when we beat Northwestern that one year, so I thought he was an appropriate choice to lead us into segment two here. I'm Jared Morris, here with Coach Brian Tonsoni and Andy Bottoms. We're breaking down Indiana's uh, Wednesday night first-round Big Ten tournament victory over Nebraska. It is time for tonight's meaningful moments that you uh, might have missed. Andy, let me go over to you first, because obviously Ryan and I did a lot of talking there at the end of the last segment. Let's get you guys back in here. Uh, do you have some meaningful moments that you want to that you want to hop in with here to begin? I feel like most of the ones that I had were about Armand. I, I had multiple <laughs> times that uh, were, there were down a here, lot and of I them. think and I think quite honestly, we've we've almost touched on all of them. There was another play. Um, I, you know, I, the the stretch in the second half I, I mentioned when it got down to ten. Uh, that he played really well. That was another good help defense play. He didn't take a charge in that scenario. This was back in the first half, um, but it gave Duran enough time to recover and get a block. Uh, and I thought that was uh, I thought that was big. And I, and like Coach said, I thought the way they came out in the beginning of the second half was important. Um, while they didn't completely put uh, put them away, I, I do think they you know were able to distance themselves and built on the momentum that they had from the end of the first half. So you know really the close of the first half and the beginning of the second half in in totality, I forget what how, what the run got to. It was like twenty four to three or uh, or something like that. So um, that that was good to see. You would have liked to see him not necessarily like extend the lead even more, and it ended up at twenty five. But um, you know, short of really letting that that eleven zero run from Nebraska in, in the one point in the second half, um, I thought that early stretch really set the tone and was at least some sign of uh 
killer instinct or whatever you want to call it that we've struggled to see from this team at times and even against inferior opponents where they would push out to a lead, let him back in it, push out to a lead and, and let him back in it. So I thought those stretches were big, but the, yeah, most of the, most of the notes I had that fell under that section were uh, largely Armand related. Uh, coach, the one that really stood out to me was when it was 49 to 36 in the second half. So Indiana, you know, it came out, we were up by nine at halftime. Came out, had a quick 6-2 run you know, in the first half, getting the ball inside, playing good defense. Like It really looked like they came out ready to play. But Archie took a timeout you know, after that 6-2 run. But Dylan Wallace, uh, our student intern who was there, uh, you know, noted that he was yelling at Rob Finnessy for being blown by because Rob did get blown by in a couple possessions uh, early in the first half. And you know, when Indiana came out of that timeout, they also kind of extended the defensive pressure. And what I liked about this is, is it felt to me, and again, we have no way of knowing this for sure, but it felt to me like a coach who, you know, in game 32 kind of knows his team and can kind of see when maybe a little bit of relaxation happens. And I thought that was a really well-timed timeout. You get on a guy like Rob who can take it because, as Dylan said in his tweet, you know, Rob basically responded to him like, I know, I know, I know, like I can't let that happen. And then Indiana comes out, they immediately extend the lead back out to 58 to 38. You know, so at a time where we've often seen this team kind of fall into a little bit of a lull, it really felt like Archie was like, we are not having this right now. And it was like, whatever message he had at halftime, he wanted to reinforce early in the second half and just make sure that we push the lead out. Now, Nebraska would cut it to like nine later in the second half, so it's not like it lasted that long. But I did think it was something that I don't think that we would have seen from him earlier in the season, but that was a really nice button to press in this particular game that worked. Well, it, it's it's nice for two reasons, and he he's done it a little bit at times after free throws uh, in some games, and I was wondering that same thing when he's doing that. But coaches do use a pressure to get players uh, in the flow defensively. That and at each uh, time on the shot clock, so they can't do that dribble action, dribble action for 20 seconds and force you to guard on the half court for 20 seconds. It's a way of uh, changing it up on the half court as well by – uh, taking some time if you don't force a turnover and a steal. So there's there's many reasons why I think that was a good move. And and then the the plus is you know we all, when when it gets to 21 you always want it to go to 30. Uh, but the big thing was that it went from 13 to 21 because every team is going to have a run and that run got it back to nine and not any closer. If you kept it at 13, gave up that run, now it's a two or three point game and the pressure in this must win situation gets tighter. So that adjustment was very good. And I think that was a big part of, of why it was a comfortable, um, after, after it got back down to nine, it got, it got comfortable in the second half. The other note or moment that, that stuck out to me, Andy, was, you know, there in the second half in the middle when Nebraska did cut it down. You know, Indiana led by 21. I think Nebraska ended up going on an 11 0 run to cut it to 10. And, you know, it was the usual culprits when this stuff happens. Indiana had turnovers. They had, you know, poor shot selection that might as well have been turnovers. You know, Justin Smith taking a three pointer, Devontae Green taking quick shots. And Nebraska was really able to capitalize. And, you know, and look, Justin had his moments offensively. I think he was six for 12. He did a nice job scoring inside. But, you know, sometimes when we really see this team relax, you know, they relax as much kind of mentally as they do physically, almost more mentally, you know, and, and you see it a lot where they don't throw the ball inside and they settle for early shots and guys who maybe shouldn't be taking outside shots are settling for outside shots. And then you're not getting back in transition. And it's like this little snowball that just goes, you know, until someone can kind of step up and make a play and stop it. And so, you know, as good as that stretch was early in the second half, that stretch in the middle of the second half was a good reminder that, you know, a team kind of is what it is in game 32, and they're not just going to develop a, a, a killer instinct in game 32. Now, they had enough, and there was enough of a talent disparity and enough of a depth disparity in this game that it didn't matter, and Indiana pushed the lead out. But that is, that segment in isolation, to me, is really concerning in a game like this. When you're at that point where you can really stomp on their necks and end the game, and we just saw that relaxation from Indiana. And look, for as many more games as this team is going to play, however many that is, it's just something that we're going to have to deal with from this team. You know, you just have to hope that the good runs are good enough that you can give yourself some space because those lulls are coming. Um, it just seems to be something that's baked into the DNA of this team. Yeah, that, that stretch that you talked about, I mean, I, I think I tweeted this out. There was a nine-possession stretch where six of them ended either in missed three-pointers or turnovers and, and the turnovers were largely careless one of those was one from Armand that was 
I'm not, I think he thought somebody was cutting back door, but it was just, there was just no, I mean, threw the ball directly to the other team. Fantasy missed the three. Devontae missed two in a row on a couple of possessions. And the Justin one that I think was an air ball if it, or if it wasn't was, was really close to it. And you had similar stretches like that in the first half. We, we talked about that a little bit when Nebraska went to the zone, IU got really at times lax about trying to get the ball inside and just settled for three pointers. And they were hitting threes relatively well when they would get them on kickouts. They just weren't making them well when they just passed the ball around the perimeter and then fired up shots. So, um, yeah, I think with this team, you know, as you said before about uh, for a different reason, you know, we're 32 games into the, uh, into the season with this group. And I think in some ways what you saw during even that stretch was a little bit predictable. And uh, even at times during the the stretch of the second half, I think we've seen a little bit down the stretch. They've been able to pull themselves out of those sequences a little bit faster, um, but really heading into that flurry uh, of, of, of scoring at the end of the first half, it was a little bit of the same thing. There were some missed threes. There were missed free throws, um, turnovers. It's just, you know, the same symptoms from this team kind of creep up every time that you have runs like that. And uh, it, it's probably, uh, if not certainly too late in the season to think that those are going to go away uh, at this point or even shorten substantially. But those are the stretches when they just settle for the shots that the defense is daring them to take as opposed to uh, working to get the shots that they want to get. Um, Coach, do you have any, do any other moments that yeah. are – Stand out I, I don't have it marked uh, time stamped or anything, but there was a play where Devontae uh, deflected the ball. He was guarding the, the ball at the point and deflected it and got a steal, which led to points. And I think that was in that stretch that pushed it up to, to 21. There were some other times where, you know, I, I look at the little things, and Devontae's body language was perfect tonight. Uh, he didn't take Agree great that. shots he, at times and, and maybe a turnover here or there, but he had four assists to two turnovers, and we'll talk about stats coming up. But I really liked his body language. And, I, and on the floor, I thought he was hustling to help. I thought he was uh, moving and cutting well, and, and he just didn't have that, I'm out, I'm going to get mine look to him. He looked like he wanted to play um, play really, really well tonight. And then I also talked about that bench stuff too. To see Devontae Green, a captain, a senior, who has – he's been questioned about his desire to be an Indiana guy, really appreciating Armand Franklin, I think that's that was uh, a moment for me that uh, was meaningful. We'll get to the stats in a second. I want to – I just want to address this real quick. You know, I'm seeing on Twitter these reports. So, obviously, people who watch the game, you know, meaningful moments, they showed these clips of Fred Hoiberg on the sidelines. And I mean, like it, all, it kind of looked like he was getting progressively sicker as the game went on. And obviously, he was taken to the hospital after the game as a precaution. You know, they're, I guess, keeping everybody away from the Nebraska locker room. But I'm seeing these reports that he felt sick all day, felt bad, and decided to coach in the game anyway. That I mean, if that's true, and again, we're just kind of going off reports here, that is one of the most irresponsible decisions given what is going on right now. You know, and coach, we had a text conversation earlier today, you know, about, you know, kind of what they should do and, you know, why, you know, it might be reasonable to not have crowds of 17,000 people there, but hey, let the players play because it's a small group of people and at least they can make the choice to go or not. But if you are not feeling well, you cannot show up to that. I mean, that is, sorry, I was kind of shocked when I saw that. I mean, you cannot do that in this situation. So well, I hope he's okay, and I hope there's no bad fallout from this. But, you know, those are the kinds of decisions. Like, we all have to take personal responsibility to where if we don't feel sick, don't go out into a group of people to work wherever where you can spread that. That is just, we have to have, I think that's something everybody can agree on, no matter where you stand on this whole story, is that lack of common sense, that is, that's just bad. You cannot do yeah. that. Well, and a couple people have have tweeted out. I, I guess I think I knew this on some level and had forgotten. But Hoiberg has a history of like heart disease and has a pacemaker. So even for his own, yeah, well being to 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 be there that way. I mean, whether it's it regardless at this point, whether it's the coronavirus or something else, putting yourself in that scenario in, in a game that, regardless of whether it's a game that you think your team wins or they're playing for anything or whatever is just silly at this point. And for the Nebraska administration to allow that knowing um, that that had been the case. Cause I think Andy Katz had tweeted something out that he talked to Archie and even Archie knew earlier in the day that Hoiberg said he wasn't feeling well or something like that. So just kind of crazy. And you know, there's a lot of speculation in terms of what that means for, 
the IU players and, and coaches who were on the floor against them. You know, it's one thing somebody talked about, yeah, they didn't, you know, do the hand, didn't do like handshakes or whatever. Well, I mean, who cares? You were just out on the court with those guys for two hours. Like at that point, I think it was Jared Odell actually that, that tweeted that. Like what the, it, it, you know, the handshake, while that's a fine precaution is, uh, at that point, not really enough. And, and I guess somebody also said that, uh, that fish said signing off was my gut tells me this is going to be the last basketball game. So who knows, who knows what happens, uh, from here in, in, in terms of that, but yeah, really just kind of reckless and irresponsible decision to be out there from, from Hoiberg, depending upon what the, the scenario is. Yeah. The, I totally agree. And, and, and I'm just telling you that as coaches though, you, your mentality is to coach through, yeah, through that. But the today is different. Uh, yes. w- with this outbreak, it is really different, and it's not being a tough guy. It's not, you know, it's your job. Uh, you know, I, I had to one time. I was a head coach. I went to the doctor and had to get some fluids and stuff just to go to the game. And you'll do anything to coach, but that, and you probably shouldn't even at that situation. Um, <laughs> but coaches have that mentality. But in this environment, if if you're not right, uh, you 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 don't need to put yourself in that uh, position. And um, you know the 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 Odo comment is is just right because the ball you're touching the ball you're sweating uh there th- those things it's um and that's where you know i i think there was an article that was floating around about trying to sh- you know decrease the curve or whatever and that made a lot of sense and i'm even at the point if it's this bad then it, you need to go even further as much as i want the games to play even without fans and and uh want to see the ncaa tournament i want everyone healthy and, yeah. and maybe it takes even bigger steps than just the the big uh events uh being shut down uh and i just need to acquire more information about everything to really make a a, a trusted opinion but the bottom line is safety and, yeah. and and safety for for everyone first and foremost and uh that yeah that was not a, a good decision no I, I can empathize with the mindset you know right. the coach's That's what mindset I'm to say. i i get that but you know don't be a hero you know the heroic thing to do honestly if you don't feel good is if the symptoms are mild stay home so that you don't clog up the hospitals and the healthcare system you know but if you you know, start if you're feeling worse and you think you need to get tested, then you got to go in or you got to stay home, stay away from groups of people, you know? So anyway, that's really more just a public service announcement than anything, but hopefully he's okay. We'll talk about this more at the end of the show, but let's, um, let's cover some stats real quick because there is nothing more important at this moment in the sports world than stats from Indiana's 25 point victory over Nebraska. Um, assists, 23 assists on 35 made field goals. That's good. Uh, the free throw shooting disparity was not good for Indiana. Uh, it was overall, uh, Indiana shot te- uh, 10 of 17. Nebraska shot 14 of 20. Really, there shouldn't be any way that Nebraska is taking more free throws than Indiana. So that's maybe one negative that you would take away from this. But the one stat that I thought was really, really interesting is in the first half, 10 players played. Everybody scored. Indiana had 43 points. The leading scorer had seven. And then... You know, one guy had two, and then you had like three guys with six, another with five, you know, three more with four. It was an extremely balanced scoring attack uh, in the first half. And really, it ended up being that for the whole game as five guys were in double figures. Uh, No one, you know, had more than 13. And, you know, everybody who played scored at least three, except for Bybee and Childress, who played there at the end. So, you know, that's for a team that doesn't really have a go to score outside of Trace Jackson Davis, and he's still not a guy that um you know, even when he's really he's really going, is probably gonna pop for twenty plus. You know, balanced scoring is how this team's gonna have to win, and that's what they what they did today. So those numbers jumped out. Obviously Armand's plus minus I thought was actually a telling stat tonight. What stood out to you, Andy? Yeah, the three point shooting, forty percent, uh or almost forty one percent, nine out of twenty two. I thought Again, like I said earlier, when they really took their time getting the ball inside and, and got some kickouts, um, that they were able to knock down open shots, which is something we haven't uh, haven't seen too consistently from the team. Rebounding was uh, was relatively good after a slow start on that end. Uh, points in the paint, IU had a lot early. They ended up outscoring them forty to twenty four in the paint. I think you know a lot of the free throws that IU gave up to Nebraska was a continued inability to. Uh, to stop drivers and, and fouling guys at the basket. So that continues to be uh, a potential concern as you go forward. Free throw shooting, as you said, both in in volume was not great, but also in quality uh, was not particularly good. The 12 blocks, though, were uh, were impressive on the defensive end. 
um, as you did that. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, about the numbers that you'd take away from a game that was, that ended up this lopsided, um, limited Nebraska pretty well from a three point shooting standpoint, particularly after they came out and shot it really well, uh, at the beginning. Um, but as you said, the balance scoring in a game like this, I think it's a, a function of being able to get a lot of guys involved, get a lot of guys a number of minutes and, and really what you'd want to see out of a game like this, uh, again, assuming that you're playing tomorrow, you didn't really tax anybody from a minute standpoint and you were able to get a lot of guys in the flow of the game, uh, get them in the scoring column and, uh, and, and hopefully build some momentum for, uh, what we hope is a game tomorrow. Coach, any um, stats for you? Yeah. I- the, the lack of offensive rebounding, it's been a good night. There's a lot of good stats, but there were a key a couple key stretches where the offensive rebounds uh, turned into some points, and you had 10 um, point, second chance points. But that was the key in earlier games against Nebraska. And again, when you're hitting 53%, there's not as many opportunities. But I thought that for the first 10 minutes, lacking that offensive rebound, Nebraska did a good job securing defensive rebounds, kept this game really, really close until that last six or seven minute stretch. And this team, when you play a better defensive team, is going to have to really make sure they have good effort uh, rebounding because it's not going to be as smooth sailing for our guards and just for offenses as we've seen good defensive teams really shut Indiana down uh, with, with their struggles on offense. So would like to see the next game, whenever it's played, that the offensive rebound effort gets to be a little bit better. But good assists. Uh, it's what you want to do against a team like Nebraska. You, you want to have a game like this. You don't want to you don't want to win and have bad stats and and play bad because then that. That's just not good carryover. So this is what was needed statistically and uh, from the, the win. And and now you uh, you prepare like you're going to play tomorrow until they tell you not to get on the bus. Did did you guys mention the 12 blocks? Sorry, I was reading stuff yes. on Twitter. Okay. You know, that that's one other, you know, one other stat that I wanted to mention because, you know, we knew how Nebraska was going to play. They were going to spread things out and they were inevitably going to get some drives going to the basket or some back doors. They surely got more than Archie would have liked, and, and you would have liked to see Indiana contain them a little bit better. But it was nice to see that when guys got beat, we had the ability to protect the rim a little bit. And whether it was the guy blocking his own man or Trace coming over, you know, from help side to help out, you know, 12 blocks, that's good. Now, you're not going to get, you know, that against most teams. Nebraska was obviously susceptible to it, uh, but I thought that was at least a nice sign, uh, you know, showing some rim protection there, even when guys were getting beat a little bit. Okay. Let's keep the show rolling here. Uh, coming up on the assembly call, we are going to hand out our game balls. We'll hit some other lingering storylines because there are plenty of them. And then we will look ahead to Indiana's potential next opponent tomorrow night. Then it'll be time for last call. That's next here on the assembly call. Stick with us. This is Jordan Halls, and I never miss a shot or an episode of The Assembly Call. Thank you, Jordan. You are listening to The Assembly Call IU postgame show. Catch us live immediately following every IU basketball game, plus every Thursday night at our website, assemblycall.com. While you are there, make sure that you sign up for our free IU Hoops email newsletter. Over 7,000 of your fellow IU fans have subscribed. You can also text IU to 66866 to subscribe to the newsletter. That is IU to 66866. 866. All right. I'm Jared Morris here with Andy Bottoms here with the coach Brian Tonsoni. We're breaking down Indiana's opening round Big Ten tournament victory over the Nebraska Cornhuskers 89 to 64 uh, on Wednesday night. One of the most surreal uh, nights, not just sports nights that we've uh, experienced in a long time. Uh, time now, guys, for the game balls feel, you know, there's a there's definitely a few options, but I feel like I have an idea where this is going to go. Andy, why don't you go first? Yeah, I'd I'll give mine to Armand. I thought it was just a really well-rounded performance from him. Uh, the turnovers were were not great by any means, but 13 points, grabbed eight rebounds, had three assists, drew, I believe, three charges uh, over the course of the game. So coming for the crown from Brad Davison, apparently. Uh, and so I, I thought he was uh, I thought he was really engaged. And I thought, like you said, just from a energy and and that standpoint was really brought a lot to the game when he came in because I think uh, you know IU got off to a good start. I think got comfortable with the fact they were going to be able to score whenever they needed to, uh, and and then kind of 
slept walk their way through uh, a, a chunk of that game or chunk of the first half. And I thought he came in and really um, brought a good spark, played really well, took advantage of an opportunity and was able to knock down uh, for the most part, open shots to get kickouts. I mean, that's something we've been clamoring for, uh, for the, for the entirety of the season was just being able to find somebody who could step out and make outside shots. So uh, apparently at the very least in bankers life field, field house, he's that guy. <laughs> He sure is. I think he is. Let's see. He was four for five in the first game. So seven of 10 at Banker's Life. And I think he's eight of 51 in all other gyms this year. So definitely comfortable at Banker's Life. Uh, Coach, who gets your game ball? You know, um, it's kind of hard not to go with, uh, and this isn't who I'm going with, but Trace Jackson Davis has a double-double, 11 points and 17 rebounds and four blocks, and we're not going to give him the game ball. It's like Walt he's, Bellamy stats right there. Yeah, he's just been tremendous uh, all year long uh, for the Indiana Hoosiers and just is a pleasure to watch. And he's had some freshman ups and downs here lately, you know, a long season and playing through a sprained uh, foot. So, that's a great performance tonight uh, from him. I thought his rebounding was very, very important. But it's kind of hard not to go with Armand as well. 13 points, 8 rebounds, 3 assists. Uh, and a, and I just think that being ready when your number was called uh, is just impressive. And then add the three charges to it. Um, I, I just have to second Andy's uh, choice um, of you know Armand Franklin. Yeah, I uh I mean Armand obviously gets it because you two guys voted for him. You know, Devonte I thought he was, you know, really good in the first half and then it tailed off a little bit in the second half. That's what you're going to get from Devonte, you know, you're going to get some good stretches and then it's bad and you know, it it kind of goes all over the place, but I did think that stretch that I mentioned in the banner moment was the best individual stretch of play any Hoosier had in this game and I agree with you coach that I thought his bot like he just, he looked engaged tonight. You know, and even some of the mistakes, they were mistakes, not kind of lackadaisical mistakes. Like, yeah, you know, you want some of those shots back, but those are honestly, that's his role on the team is to take those shots. And so at this point, you know, 32 games into the season, we can bitch about him a little bit, but like it is what it is. And frankly, he's asked to take those shots. So, you know, I don't have as much of a problem with him taking them because he's proven he can make them. It's other guys that I think shouldn't be taking them. T- T- Devontae's heat checks don't bother me as much as getting beat off the drive defensively and, and not really being in position defensively and help and getting caught and lost on defense and then the casual turnovers like that little lob pass yeah. game or two ago. Those are the things that bother me because that's lack of engagement. When you're taking shots and feeling like you're in a game and you're hot, that you're engaged in the game. You just might yes. not make the best decision. That, there's a difference there. And you want your best players to push the envelope uh, or your best scorer to, to push the envelope a little bit. And, and let me be clear, just so everybody understands, like this Indiana team is a decent offensive team. It's not a good offensive team. It's not a great offensive team. On an offensive team that more consistently got good looks, I wouldn't like those shots from Devontae. But the opportunity cost of those shots <laughs> isn't often a much better shot. So like for the context of this season is what I'm talking about. Um, but I, look, I think making a case for Trace Jackson Davis for the game ball is a worthy one. You know, those numbers are fantastic. Indiana's interior defense was really important. He led that charge with the four blocks. And, you know, I like seeing him when the other team sells out and he could get frustrated staying engaged and doing the other stuff. You know, and I think that's an important mentality for a a freshman like him to have who is so important to what this team uh, does. So I think Armand is a worthy winner. Uh, I could absolutely, uh, you know, argue for Trace as well. Uh, But, you know, a number of solid performances, you know, from different players. But I think those definitely were the ones that stood out. Any other storylines from this game outside of uh, Archie's halftime uh, interview was fantastic. They asked him, I guess he he had a little tirade or a little a heated conversation with the refs, we will say. They asked him what the conversation was about. He paused and said pleasantries, uh, which I thought was great deadpan delivery, very concise. I think Archie tends to deliver his messages better when they're in a more concise manner than when he meanders with a strange metaphor. But, you know, that's just that's just, that's just my thoughts I wonder, on it. I wonder to what you could be referring. <laughs> Which still had its good points. But I think when Archie is short and to the point, I just think he's a little more effective. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, that's probably fair. That's probably fair. Now, I, you know, the only other guy that I might throw out is Duran. I thought he had some decent minutes. This, this was a game when, uh, given how, how small Nebraska is and how they like to play a game that you, you would project 
maybe it's a, a difficult one for him to play in. Um, but he had a couple of blocks, had six points, stepped out and hit a, uh, you know, hit another long jumper as he's done. So I thought, you know, continuation of a, a solid performance from him. I, I think, as you said earlier, a good thing about this was a lot of guys were able to, uh, you know, get in the scoring column, get some confidence. So I thought he was one that gave some uh, solid minutes off the bench uh, in in there. So he was another guy that played well. And and as you guys mentioned, I thought the bench just in general seemed really engaged. Um, you guys talked about that, but, you know, those times, you know, four or five guys standing over there, um, really, really getting into it with what was going on. So, you know, who knows? Maybe we're reading too much into that, but it's something I don't feel like we've seen a great deal of over the course of the season. And um, a, a hopefully a good show of togetherness. One one just other kind of random thought I had during this game as Jerome Hunter had a couple more just really bad passes. I mean, telegraphed passes. I think if, if you were to make a list of the most important individual skills for players that need to improve in the offseason, I think Jerome Hunter's passing is somewhere in the top 10. Like, I think it's real. Like, I think his passing has been really bad this season. And look, I think part of that is because he hasn't played in a year. I think, you know, you take a year off and he's adjusting to college anyway. The game can be fast. There's a lot of new things coming at him. But what it's led to is you look at what he is on offense right now. He is strictly a catch and shoot guy. You know, he's not a guy that can really create for anybody else. And he's not right now showing that he can be an effective passer to get the ball in the post or even consistently be a ball mover around the wing because oftentimes his passes are telegraphed and stolen or they're even just a little bit off to where a guy has to jump, you know, a half step to get the ball and it kind of takes him out of what might have been a a movement toward the basket or even a potential shot attempt. You know, so if anybody could use like a John Beeline passing camp for a week, it would be Jerome because I think if he can add that, he has so many other offensive skills and so much offensive talent that that would be really important. You know, I didn't watch him play in high school, so I don't know if this is something that he was good at in high school and has just struggled to adapt to the college game. But as he looks to go from being a guy who plays, you know, 15 to 20 minutes off the bench and contributes, you know, some spot up threes every now and then to being a guy who's more involved in the offense, I think he's got to have more confidence in his passing and the coaching staff has to have more confidence in it. So it's not something that's going to get better like this season. I just think as you look toward the off season, that's a very important individual skill to improve. And, and what he's got to do is he's got to combine making the right read, which I think he does at times with making the right pass. Yeah. That read, that read was there. That was the place the ball needed to go, but the post couldn't break away. Uh, and so it was a bad pass. And, and he has a lot of those where, okay, it's kind of the right thing to do, but it's either too hard, wrong direction, whatever. And that's the speed of the game, and that's being a, a freshman, basically, where he needs to get better. I do think he sees and is okay with passing as opposed to not wanting to pass. He's just not very good at it, and that, that'll come with the playing time. By the way, I forgot during meaningful moments, one of the most impressive defensive plays of the game was Jerome's chase down block. That play yes. was great. The hustle to get down there. I don't remember what happened after that. I've got it written down somewhere. Um, but that play was really terrific. Oh, yeah, it was at the 1330 mark. And Armand got blocked. The run out for Nebraska. Jerome hustles back for that chase down block. And then it was up ahead to Devontae for a three. And that was an important you know, bucket. It put Indiana up 21. He had a nice steal in the first half, I thought, that got some defensive momentum going for Indiana. So you're seeing a guy who I think... After struggling for a stretch defensively, I think his defense, uh, you know, is improving a little bit now these last few games. Um, but yeah, you know, all these players have certain things to improve. That one, though, for a guy that I legitimately think has all Big Ten potential, I really do. And I think he can be a 15 to 17 point score. Being able to pass, being a threat that way is really going to help him out. So hopefully that's something he really uh, is able to work on and improve uh, in the offseason coming into next year. Yeah, good call on the chase down block. A lot has happened since then, so I did forget about that. But yeah, yeah. he totally just erased that guy. I, I wasn't sure that he guy did. would even get up after that and just be like, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I'll no, see you guys a, later. It was a phenomenal play. Um, all right, so that's pretty much everything from the game. Let's talk because we're we're live on the radio right now. So we got to do last call. We let's look ahead to Penn State just a little bit. We'll hang around on the podcast afterwards and we'll talk coronavirus, the impact, games, all that stuff. So we will hit that. And if you're listening on the radio and you want that conversation, you can listen to the podcast, but it'll probably you know take a little while. So we don't have enough airtime for all that. 
Um, but let's, I haven't seen an announcement yet that the game's not going to be played. So let's at least take a glance ahead to the game, the potential game for tomorrow night, Andy, which is against Penn state. Um, you know, I posited on podcast on the brink earlier this week that it seems like we might be catching them at a decent time. You know, they were really rolling in the middle of the season. I think they've lost five out of six, something like that. And I've never thought this is a particularly bad matchup for us. We just played badly and were underhanded up in Happy Valley. You know, then we're able to beat them at home. I think it's a good even matchup, and I think it could produce a really good game. But this is absolutely the kind of game that I think Indiana can and to a certain extent should win, you know, against a good team. Maybe should is the wrong word, but it's absolutely like a game that you go into saying, hey, 50-50, we play well. We're going to have a chance down the stretch to win this one. Maybe that's the more fair way to say it. Yeah, that that's probably fair. I, you know, you look at at Penn State; they went one and five over their last six games. And the one game they won, they hit a three in the closing seconds to beat Rutgers in a game they had a, as I recall, a fairly frantic comeback to even get it to that point. Um, so th- they certainly cannot be coming into the game with uh, with a great deal of confidence. So uh, I think that that bodes well. And as you said, I, you played well. Well, I, they did not play well against them in the first half in Happy Valley. They were tied with them going into the locker room after both teams played poorly. But, you know, they really played them even in that scenario, even when not playing their best, even without Jerome and Race. Uh, so I think that that does bode relatively well um, for IU. And I think as you sit back and look at potential matchups, this one is as good as any for IU, which is not to say they're going to win. Um, but, but I do think from a, a matchup standpoint, it's not, it's not terrible. Um, you know, you got to find a way to, to figure out how to contain Lamar Stevens. Um, Justin Smith has been successful at that at times. Um, other, at other times, you know, Stevens has played really well. So, um, you don't want them to get really hot from three. Uh, I think that's another, uh, another big one. I think there was a stretch in that first game where they really did, um, you know, did get hot there, but, uh, you know, take care, take good care of the basketball. Um, I think turnovers is really what, if I remember right, in that first game toward the, uh, there was a stretch where I just turned the ball over incessantly and really lost lost any chance at the game at that point. So um, it's been an area they've done better at lately. I think tonight's carelessness in some ways was just due to the the nature of the game. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think I like IU's chances in the game there. While they are playing the second game in two days, nobody played a ton of minutes and and I think we've seen in some of these scenarios where one team that's that's played the day before, you're not quite to the point where you've played three games in three days, four games in four days, where you're really just flat out exhausted. But you're at a point when you've really got, um, you know, y- you have some rhythm that, that goes into the game. And I think sometimes that can really help in these tournament settings. You know, Indiana only gave up 64 points in that first meeting and got beat by 15. But if the game is in the low 60s and, and they won and gave up 60, so if they can, if you could tell me that uh, Indiana's defense can hold Penn State sixty to sixty four, I think Indiana, with just a pretty good offensive uh, showing, can win the game. So Indiana has shown that they could defend Penn State, and I think some of that first game uh, was some home run turnovers and some fouling late, uh, and that was a, one of those quit games where Indiana got down and pouted and it got a little ugly. So I think this is a, one of the teams that Indiana might match up with a little bit better. The thing that worries me is the closer. Uh, Lamar Stevens can pull shots out of anywhere and, and hit shots even though he's well regarded. And teams with closers, which Indiana is missing, at least from a perimeter or a, a slasher type closer, you, you do have a post you know player who's pretty dominant. Um, that always worries you in an elimination game that you're doing everything right and you're there tight and then he hits you know three shots in the last two minutes that are out of out of his mind uh they have that indiana doesn't so uh i think it's going to come down to guard play and being able to handle the ball and not give free points and, and then be able to hit some shots enough to get to mid 60s to the 70s and, and play what you have done against penn state but i think it's a it's one of the teams that indiana matches up um a little bit better it's it's not like michigan or someone else where indiana really hasn't shown anything this year um so it'll be interesting tomorrow night I saw several people tweet that when Don Fisher signed off from his broadcast, he said that his gut feeling was that we may not, we're probably not going to be seeing any more basketball. What's your gut feeling? Do you think this game gets played tomorrow, given everything that we've 
seen tonight. I mean, it's such a quick turnaround for tomorrow. They're going and and the first game is at noon. You know, so I mean, they're going to have to make some quick decisions. And they still haven't. You know, as we talk right now, I think the Nebraska team is still you know, in the locker room and they're not allowing anybody back there. So, I mean, it is a very much developing situation, but what's your gut feeling just on whether these games tomorrow will be played? Do you have one? Uh, I, I have a gut feeling that they, um, they won't be played simply because the NBA suspended and an NBA player has tested positive. And now you're looking at who was he in contact with, on the court and the la- and they play so many games and so I think that's what led to the suspension and if um I-, I just have a feeling like this stuff starts rolling I mean it was just what 48 hours when you started hearing you know of some cancellations of the Ivy League and all of that and now we're down to you know no fans almost everywhere and now a league canceling and Major League Baseball considering it and NHL considering it um you know, we, uh, our high school team is wondering, you know, is that going to, is it going to trickle down to the state tournament, um, type of, and we have no idea. I haven't talked to our coach, haven't anything, but today has been such a crazy day that it wouldn't wow. surprise me. At least they suspend it till they get a handle on if no fans and teams are okay and players are okay and maybe push it back and, and I could see a delay, but I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not too sure it's going to go on. Just saw this uh, from Ryan Field, ABC, uh, on Twitter. He said, per ESPN, players from teams the Jazz have played within the past 10 days, so this is, you know, regarding the NBA, are being told to self-quarantine. Those teams are the Cavs, Knicks, Celtics, Pistons, and Raptors. That obviously affects a few uh, Indiana players in the NBA. But more for this topic, you know, if it is found, let's say, just hypothetically, that, you know, Fred Hoiberg, has coronavirus would it, i'm assuming it would be a similar recommendation you know on that point that teams that nebraska have now maybe it's different if it's a coach than a player i don't know um i'm kind of with you coach like if i had to put money on it if you're asking me for my gut feeling and maybe we can talk a little bit later about what we think is the right decision but it does seem like it's trending in this direction i think at this point i will be surprised a if we if I go to bed tonight, you know, not knowing what they're going to do, but I think if I wake up tomorrow morning and and you know start getting ready to watch these Big Ten tournament games, if they're actually still planned to go on, I think at this point that would be kind of surprising. Yeah, it, which is I, crazy it, that it's gotten here so fast. But I mean, yeah, just, if you think about, it's been what less than thirty six hours since the Ivy League canceled their tournament, and at that point everybody was like, that seems like a rash decision, and then look at all all that's changed in a relatively short time period. I, yeah, I, I struggle to believe that, you know, whether other conferences do, uh, do the same or do something different is, is tough to say, but I, I just struggle with the Hoiberg stuff of the optics of that. And then turning around and saying, Hey, we're going to go play these games anyway. It just feels, um, feels strange to me. And I think it's one of those where, uh, you've seen, I think most all major leagues have basically said at this point, we're not going to have fans in the stands and all those kinds of things. I mean, the dominoes fall pretty fast once one, one conference makes that decision and um, the impacts do it in that way. So yeah, I'd be, I'd be pretty surprised at this point. Yeah. I also, you know, I kind of think at this point, I think waiting to see if a guy tests positive or not is kind of a silly way to do it because it's inevitable that someone will. So it's like, let's just make a decision if we're going to play or if we're not, because just waiting for like a single test seems like a really myopic way, given kind of what we know about how this thing spreads if you're if you're going to be that if you're going to take that drastic a measure if you see a positive test rather than saying like okay this you know this person was sick but we're still going to go on with the games then just do it you don't have to wait for like the confirmation of one test yeah i mean yeah. i guess that probably maybe it makes it a little bit easier to sell publicly when you say that but i just think it's kind of unnecessary like make the decision for what you think is right because like if you play the games, someone's going to test positive. <laughs> like it's it's just kind of inevitable, and who knows? We may have had that tonight, so we'll see. We'll see what happens again. I'm not even saying one way or the other. I'm just saying as you're looking to make the decision, just make it independent of that, and then proceed forward. Yeah, I, no, I think that's a totally fair point. I, yeah, I don't know that. I don't know what you need to see at some point that says, you know, how far does it need to get before you'd say that you need to do it. It, it just if you if you feel strongly enough that you don't want fans to be there, it kind of is one of those where do you really want anybody to be there? I, I understand they're trying to make it work for probably a variety of, of selfish and unselfish reasons, probably. But uh, 
yeah, I just don't really know how you, you look at it, some of these things and, and turn around and say you're going to play. But um, we'll, uh, we'll kind of see what happens potentially overnight or as the situation develops. Well, as a question that is almost surely to be proven moot, uh, as we look towards Selection Sunday, you two are some of the best bracketologists out there. Just real quick, I mean, is Indiana in still? I'm assuming yes, but I just want to get your official on-the-record take for those who may not be as up-to-the-minute on bracketology. Yeah, I mean, I'd still have them on the 10 line. There haven't really been a lot of teams to this point that have played, that were in front of them that have played. Um, there's a few bubble teams in action. Some of the, them have fared well, some of them not so much. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I really have IU pretty much right where they already were. This game isn't one that's going to move them up a seed list of any kind, but um, really was their last opportunity to take what would be considered a bad loss uh, from a, a team sheet standpoint. So they avoided that. And uh, in that regard, are still in, I would be probably hesitant to put them in an absolute stone cold lock at this point, but I would, uh, I think a lot of things would have to happen for them not to make it at this point. Yeah. You know, I, I think, um, some teams that are below them, uh, did lose, uh, tonight, a Stanford lost. Uh, I just, um, if you had Indiana in the last four, which I don't think so. And, and almost everyone that, that I've heard speak does not have Indiana in the last four, but I, I, I do see the path if you're heavy on metrics and heavy on the net where Indiana could be in the last four, then this win does nothing and, and they might need to win more, one more to be safe in case some teams that are out really jump up. Um, but, but I don't see that's the case. I feel uh, like Andy, I, I don't want to say absolute till I see it on selection Sunday with this team and, and what goes on. If they get beat by 20 against Penn state, that's a bad lasting optic for the, the committee, but uh, I, I think that I think they're in, and, and I think it will take a whole bunch of stuff uh, to happen for them not to be in. But um, yeah, yeah, it's kind of hard for me even to be excited about putting bracketology stuff together because I mean that's uh, you know four days away, and, and what's happened in thirty six hours has just been absolutely crazy and unbelievable. Unbelievable. So I, I put a bracket together to put everyone in in their own region and no bracket rules and to put it out on our, our web page just to put everyone out west that could be out west. I mean that that's what that's what might be like if they do end up having the tournament, I would not be surprised if they did something like that, like relaxed a lot of the bracketing rules to let teams stay regionally so that there's less travel. That absolutely right. and the, you know they're probably gonna play in different arenas. I don't know if they would move cities. But, you know, they're going to try. I think I saw that they're going to try and move the fight. If they play them, move the Final Four, move the regional sites to smaller venues since there won't be fans. So, anyway, a lot to follow. You know, we don't have the answers here at 1030 Central Time on Wednesday night. But worth uh, checking. Final update from the uh, from Banker's Life from Andy Katz, Nebraska men's basketball team not leaving Banker's Life Arena. They were brought their food outside the locker room. They're not letting people back to the area now. I just walked back to the area here, and they told me no one from Nebraska will be made available. So I don't know if that means they're not leaving Banker's Life Arena tonight or what that means, but that was the latest from Andy Katz. Yeah, uh, and Rab, John's, Rab John's tweeted out that IU left immediately after the press conference and was already back at the hotel. So that seems potentially good, but I don't. I, I'm I was pretty shocked to see that. I mean, given the contact with the players, if they're you know if you're worried about the Nebraska players, how are you and not letting them leave? How can you not be worried about people who were sharing a basketball court with them for? the better part of two hours. That's a fair question. Yeah, I don't. Good question. I don't know. But these are, you know, these are hard. Maybe we should get Ryan. Maybe we should get Ryan to call back in. Maybe he can probably answer that. <laughs> he'll, he'll have some opinions. These are, man, these are hard questions. You know, I do not, I do not envy anybody who has to make these decisions because there's no, I, I, mean, I mean, I guess as this stuff, uh, as it continues to spread, maybe the decisions become easier, but it is hard weighing the risk reward, weighing putting people out of work. I mean, there's a lot of people, if these don't get games, go, don't get played. People who work in the stadiums, people who work at restaurants nearby, you know, people who drive Uber, like you can go down the line of all the people that will be impacted. And that absolutely is worth taking into account as you try and figure out like what is, what's the best, the great, you know, the best decision for the greatest number of people. What's going to stop the spread, but not have such a horrible impact on the economy like all these things you have to take into account difficult 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 decisions um all right chad gave us a question so that we can end on a high note here um what was the question 
Oh, okay. Who would you guys pick from the IU football team if Archie Miller needed a body or two? <laughs> the old, you know, like 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 if we had to if we had to pull a couple football players, I know a Ross Hales coach. If we needed to get a Ross yeah. Hales on this team, who are, who are you taking? Guy. I know you do. <laughs> oh man, that that's a that's a. I don't know. I, I'd take Stevie Scott just because he can like run through people and run over people. I would take uh, I would take Taiwan Mullen because I think he's the Indiana I think he's Indiana football's Victor Oladipo that's yep. bringing him swagger. So bring his swagger onto receivers. the basketball court. Yeah, I'd say I, he's more likely to need a guard in that scenario. So <laughs> Mullen is a good one, although he's a little he's a little small. Maybe Wap Fillier. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. somebody. I, yeah, I, if if I need somebody, I'm I'm going to go with more of a a, a guard. But uh, you know, you never know. You might need a few fouls in there somewhere. But I think we got guys that can. Uh, Michael Penix so seems like he might have some Jerome Hunter in him, like just be able to mm. knock down some clutch three pointers, you know, step a couple feet behind the line, a very line drive shot. Like I can't imagine he's got like a nice arc on his shot, yeah. but it gets to he... the basket fast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. <laughs> good. <laughs> good question there, Chad. That was a good one to, um, to end on here. Uh, you're listening to the assembly call. IU post game show. Remember that because you're an Assembly Call listener, you get 20% off your entire order at homefieldapparel.com with the promo code ASSEMBLY20. So if you want a great deal on the most comfortable and unique IU apparel that you'll find anywhere, go to homefieldapparel.com and use the promo code ASSEMBLY20 for 20% off your entire order. All right, guys, it's time for last call. Wrap this up the best way that you can. Coach, why don't you go first? Uh, congratulations to everyone involved in the Indiana pro, uh, program to get to 20 wins. Uh, winning basketball games in college is, and in any sport is difficult, uh, and it's a season-long, off-season-long process. And, and that's just a, a nice number to hit. Uh, maybe it should have been hit earlier, but nonetheless, it is a 20-win season. And I think uh, if everything else is the same uh, and, and not in this situation, we're talking about Indiana being selected on Sunday, and I think it's a step in the right direction. So uh, in, in despite all the craziness that's going on right now outside of basketball, uh, it was nice for Indiana to come out and, and beat an opponent that it should by a margin that it did and get 20 wins. Well said, Andy. Yeah, I mean, this is a game that uh, IU did what they needed to do uh, in order to hopefully solidify a tournament bid. I think that's really all you were looking for coming into the game. Um, parts of the first half were not as good as you might have wanted them to be, but a 25-point victory is a 25-point victory, I suppose. And uh, so, yeah, just from here, it's the uncertainty of of uh, what happens next, if anything happens next, and and what you do from there. But um, a, a decent note for IU to to finish on if this may end up being the la- their last game of the season or, or whatever that looks like. But uh, yeah, I thought it was good to see them take care of business, put themselves in a position to get in the tournament. That's kind of what we've been talking about really the last few weeks, that what they wanted to do, what we set out as a reasonable expectation for the team was in front of them. Um, they had some trouble seizing those opportunities every time along the way, but uh, tonight I thought they did a decent job and uh, was excited to see so many guys get involved, so many guys contribute. I thought it was really... Uh, in that regard was uh, a really positive thing for this team going forward to the extent that there's anything to go forward to. Yeah, no, it, it, good win for Indiana tonight. Um, you know, beat them by 25 points, but, you know, you got some some good performances from, you know, a guy like Armand Franklin that hasn't played a lot of minutes. And as coach said, he was ready for his time. So from a basketball perspective, good win for Indiana. Um, you know, and then when you look from an off court perspective, obviously hope Fred Hoiberg is okay. Although his decision to come to the game was unconscionable and, you know, just Nebraska as an institution is probably going to have to answer for that because that's just a really bad decision to make in this situation. You know, and the other, only other thing I would say is, you know, it's, we're on here talking about a basketball game and obviously we all care about the basketball game and it's important, you know, and, and thinking about, you know, these sports and we want the NCAA tournament to be played and all that because it's, it's entertaining. Um, but I do think it's a good time to, you know, to give a thought, as I was mentioning earlier, to all the people who are affected, you know, by this and, and think about what there is to do. You know, obviously if there's, you know, there's not going to be any more games in arenas, it's hard to, you know, maybe give an extra tip to the people that are working at the concessions or, you know, or working parking because they're not going to be there working. But, you know, it's, again, you're trying to balance the economic impact with what the smart health decision is. And the thing that can be hard about this situation, I'm sure we've all experienced it, is something like this, which is health and safety and just about the well-being of people 
quickly becomes political. And a conversation that could be very productive can quickly devolve into something that isn't because we talk past each other. We, you know, we think the worst of the point the other person is making instead of trying to give each person the charity of, you know, seeing their perspective, trying to empathize. And so I think if ever there was a situation to try and put that stuff to the side, listen to each other, try to see where each other is coming from and find the common ground instead of what separates us, situations like these are good for that because the way that you help overcome and get through things like this is by coming together and making decisions for the greater good and thinking about your fellow man instead of just yourself. And so that kind of mindset in whatever way that we can facilitate it, foster it, lead by example, that's what will help us get through all of this. And it's more important than basketball games. It's more important than anything else is, you know, let's get through this as quickly, but as, you know, healthfully as possible so that we can reduce whatever health impact there is and hopefully get to the other side where we can start, you know, getting the economy back and rebuilding whatever is lost there. And I know there's no easy answers, but man, you know, sometimes just listening to each other and thinking about what you can do that is the best decision for the other people who might be affected by your actions is the best thing that we can do. And if we all do that, we'll get through this better and faster. So that's all I want to say about that. Um, and that'll do it for us on this edition of the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. If you want to see us do the show live and be part of the live chat, make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash assemblycall. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 to join our free email newsletter special thanks to longtime listener bob thompson who produces a lot of the music that you hear on the show and thank you for listening we will be back tomorrow night whether there's a game or not we will have assembly call radio tomorrow night so join us for that and until then take it from me yogi farrell keep your elbows in and your eyes on the rim and go hoosiers and wash your hands thank everybody for coming out all right i gotta get out of here folks thank you can your mom bring some tiramisu All right. Well, okay, so yeah. Fred Hoiberg transported to a local hospital emergency room. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Crazy stuff. It is crazy, crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. It is crazy. Okay, so. And we got we to gotta make sure, too, you know, um, that, you know, we, we all jump to the conclusion that it's the, the virus. It could be a, a situation with his, you know, previous health concerns it could be you know um you know something happening that's not and, and and it's just crazy in a world of great information how much information we we don't have one league's canceling new york city says you could still hold events but seattle's not holding events and i know there's all different kinds of circumstances but there's a lot of questions that i have that you know the article that uh, alex shared was really informative about you know, cutting the curve or whatever. Um, flatten the curve. Flattening, flattening the curve made a lot of sense. And then, you know, as an educator, I'm like, let's do everything. Let's not just do some things that make sense, like eliminating big events. Let's do everything and take the hit for a couple of weeks and ask each other as citizens of this great country to sacrifice for a couple of weeks to flatten that curve to make sure we're okay, not because we want to watch basketball, keep the games going, and make kids fly to different areas because it's a basketball game. Um, if it's this bad, which it seems to be, then we need to do some real measures and, and beyond just closing down big events, in, in, in my opinion. And I, I don't have enough information to really say that's the true thing, Jared and Andy, but... Um, you know, we had a conversation after school today about preparing for a long extended, uh, absence. It's not happening yet at our school, but we are preparing for lessons and things of that nature. Um, uh, most of the schools around here, colleges have canceled, uh, for the rest of the year other than e-learning. And it's just been a 36 hours. I'm 53 years old and, and, and the AIDS epidemic and 9-11, uh, what, there were some, always some, wondering and, and nervousness, but I, I've never seen anything like this in, in my lifetime. Yeah, you know, I mean, a lot of people have mentioned 9-11, and obviously that is, you know, just one of the, I mean, most tragic and indelible moments any of us have ever experienced. You know, the difference there is you knew immediately the gravity and how bad it was. And I think what has made this different is, 
people have legitimate questions about again, you know, how bad is is this for a lot of the people who get it and then is that worth the economic impact of what's going to happen there? And you know, I have my own thoughts on that, but I don't think asking those questions is bad. And I think criticizing people who ask those questions, they are legitimate questions to ask. You know, and we're still learning a lot about you know, what is the case fatality rate? You know, how bad is it actually? And, and all of those things. You know, the key is, I think, and this is what we talked about earlier today, you know, there's, there's a, people who are clearly very at risk for this. And we don't know a lot about it. We don't have great treatment for it. There's no vaccine. And if a lot of people get it at once, it overloads the healthcare system. That's the big problem with it. And so that's why the whole flattening the curve and just trying to prevent the rapid spread really seems to make the most reasonable sense of all. You know, then you get into a whole other question where it's like, you know, China helped slow the spread of this because they're an authoritarian government and they could shut down everything. We can't really do that. You know, it's got to be everybody kind of collectively coming together. But is that, you know, is that the right decision? Do you stop going to restaurants? Do you stop doing all this stuff? Does everybody stay inside for a few weeks? A, is that even reasonable to ask people to do? Will they do it? Would it really work? And would it have too big of an impact? Like, I don't know. You know, but that that's where it does get challenging. And I like earlier today, I thought, OK, let's keep, you know, no big events so it doesn't spread rapidly, but let the games go on if people choose to play in them, you know, but and I, 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 I think I still kind of side that way. But then when you see an adult make what I think is an irresponsible decision in Fred Hoiberg, you know, players are impressionable. At, at a young age, not saying they can't make decisions for themselves or don't have agency, but you know you have to have some, not necessarily assurance, but I think at least some confidence that they're going to be put in a good position. And you see stuff like that tonight, and I don't know that that kind of shook my confidence a little bit. In maybe it's not the right decision to do this, and maybe we're just trying to ask each other to do too much to try and play these games right now. I, I don't know. I want to sleep one. I don't want to say one way or the other. I think I, I like, I know what my gut feeling of what will happen, but I'm still kind of trying to gather information and, and figure it out. I, but I, I won't, I won't like disparage if they do decide to cancel the games, I won't disparage it and say right. it's a bad decision. It seems like a reasonable course <laughs> of action to take. Maybe there are others, you know, but I think you're, I, people are just trying to make, I think the best decision in a tough situation. So, I don't know. I probably talked in circles there, but that's kind of how I feel no, a little you, bit. You, you, but when like an NBA player has it, and then then you got many teams affected. Um, it's not just the mass people anymore. It's it's the team uh, that that that's you know, and it, it's it's hard for me to cancel classes and say that you can't have thirty to a hundred or two hundred in a in a room. But you're going to ask those same people who attend that university to get on a plane and maybe or a bus and go two or three hours away in a hotel, in and out. Um, it, it, what's the right consistent approach? And I'll second second what you said is I just don't know information. There's so many people doing different things to to help this situation out. Um, it's just it's it's one of the most confusing times I've ever been in, and the 36 hours of it is we we just need to take care of each other I, I would say yes make sure whatever we're doing we just take care of each other the carrier thing is more worrying than my own personal health and you know, i have an 80 year old mother uh and if i don't know i have it for seven or eight days and go visit her that that could that that's not i i want to you know what's how do you know what, what's the test if i have a mild case do i need to go get a test um those are all things that um will only be answered in time but but please just take care of each other and take care of yourselves. Yeah, I think that's the, that's kind of the biggest thing for me is, and you alluded to this, Jared. It's you know make decisions that will be best for everyone around you, regardless of whatever else is going on. That's what you know, like Coach said, the, the carrier thing. I know, I'm looking on Twitter and and Megan and and Marnie Mooney are you know going back about things, and you know Marnie has a, a young son who's had health issues and gonna have heart surgery and whatever like that would be absolutely terrifying in that in that scenario to think that someone could you know do something that's going to impact people like that or coach's mom and any of that stuff so i think that's you know if there's any I, unfortunately that's it, you know perhaps doing things that are in the best interest of those around you should should maybe not be um 
something that we need to be reminded of, but at times I think it is. And that's, I guess kind of where it comes down on it. I mean, it, it, as a basketball fan and all those kinds of things, like you don't want to see games get canceled, but there's a lot thing uh, of things that are more important. And, um, you know, I think what the NBA is doing where they're basically like, they're not saying what is and isn't going to happen. They're basically just hitting the pause button on the season right now yeah. and, and saying, Hey, we don't know enough. We got to figure it out. Um, who knows what that, that means that, that they'll figure out. And I think it's, you know, schools are making those kinds of decisions and trying to do that. And you've got to, if you make those decisions as a school here locally that closed and I, and they were talking about this, I'm sure coach, you, you think it's some of the same things they talk about this stuff. It's like, well, how do you, who, who determines when it's okay to go back once you make that decision? Like what, what are the, I think that's why nobody just knows enough. Like what are the milestones that you need to reach that say, this situation that was bad enough that said I wasn't going to do this thing. So whether that's school, games, whatever, like when do you feel good enough to say, all right, that has passed and now we and now I'm ready to restart whatever the thing is that you stopped. And I think that's just where, you know, nobody knows and you got to trust the people who are, uh, you know, well-versed enough in whether it's the history of these things or, um, you, you know, the current illness and how to, treated and, and what what works to try to figure out and give the best guidance that they can and make decisions along with that and if you put thing on things on hold for a little while then you figure it out and you figure out what those milestones are that you need to hit to be able to you know kind of go back to things being normal but no nobody uh, certainly not the three of us n- know enough to to answer those questions right now and so i think in the interim kind of goes back to what you said of just you know do what you can to make the right around you and uh, those things are more often than not are going to work out in the, in, in favor of everybody. Yep. Yeah. That's probably a good note to end on. Um, it's probably, you know, I guess, you know, just everybody keep your eyes posted to Twitter. I mean, stuff is happening so fast. So, and I'm sure you already are going to do that anyway, but that's certainly what we'll be doing. And hey, uh, hey, one, one thing to just jump in, if yeah. there's somebody just uh, tweeted out Nebraska basketball team, just got the okay to leave the locker room and load onto the bus. Now I have no idea what that means. Um, but, uh, it, it's certainly more positive than negative. So we'll take it. Good. Hey, um, I, I, this is, this pales in comparison to what we're all talking about and dealing with, but for you guys in the show, um, I was asked to be on a podcast out of Chicago. Um, the guy is um, from Crown Point or the region, and he followed Sasha Stefanovic and, and was a Purdue guy, but was a, a Purdue fan and ended up at Switchyard Brewery after the game and was wondering, you know, he's a podcast guy, and he's wondering, those four guys have this many people. Um, <laughs> and he was with a friend who follows Assembly Call and said, no, and explained that all. And uh, then he realized that I was also with Delphi Brackets, and he had been following Delphi Brackets for two years, and so I got asked to go on with um, – that and they were very complimentary. Even though he was a, a, a Purdue guy, he was very complimentary of your work, Jared and, and Andy. And and I just wanted to pass that wow. on because um, he was very impressed with that with our meetup uh, and very impressed with our work. And they were shouting it out all night long. Um, if you're you know Indiana fans in the region in Chicago to to follow us here at Assembly Call, and, and it just shows that uh, the the work that we try to do together. Uh, is is being heard and seen by a lot of people who really appreciate it. And uh, I just wanted to pass that on when I had a chance to talk to you guys as opposed to a text or whatever. But that was really – it was a good night because I'm from that area, and it's like talking to yeah. dudes back home. There's an accent and all kinds of stuff, and uh, I felt like I was back in, in Chicago drinking some old style and Look at talking that. sports, you know. So Even um, – even, all right, Purdue fans. Look, we're all yeah. coming together. Everybody's so, coming um, together. But yeah, they were very, um, very appreciative, and and they tweeted out several things. I think you've seen the tweets and yeah, and that. So, um, you know, again, cool. good job. Hey, last thing I want to note real quick. I just caught something in the in the chat mob. I know people were asking why some of their comments were banned. I, so I want to take full responsibility for this and completely back up all of our moderators in the chat mob who I know did a good job. I emailed them before the show. All all the folks who are kind enough you know, don't get paid to do this, but come in the chat mob and help us keep the conversation on target. And again, this was before the game. Think about how much stuff happened between now, you know, between the game and now. And I just asked them to make sure that we kept the discussion 
to basketball. So talk about the Corona stuff as it relates to basketball, but keep any political stuff out of it, any personal attacks, all that stuff out of it. Because frankly, my plan on the show was to not really talk about it much and stick to the game. But with everything that happened during the game, that was impossible. Like there was no way to not talk about this. And I don't know, people can judge for themselves whether we talked about it too much, whatever, but there's no way to not address it. So I get some people might look at it as a little bit hypocritical that we banned some people for talking about it. And maybe different moderators had different criteria for how they did it. And then we're on here talking about it. I get that, but I back our moderators up a hundred percent. I trust their decisions. Definitely. If you have a problem with it, you know, talk to me, I'll be happy to talk with you about it. But I, I do understand how there might be a little bit like, wait, they can talk about it on the show, but I can't talk about it here in the chat. And I don't know what the nature of the comments were. So if you were getting overly political or personal attacks, that kind of thing, then there's no excuse. We just don't do that in the chat. But, you know, if you have a grievance with it, Jared at assemblycall.com, let me know. Because I, even the people who come in and sometimes say crazy things, I appreciate you joining us. I really do. But we just try to keep the conversation to a certain tone and a certain level of civility and on topic so that it's a good place for everybody. So that's our thought. That's why, you know, we talked about that. Uh, but just, just so you know, I like specifically emailed folks before the game to try to make sure that we were on top of this for the game, but that's where, that's where that comes from. Um, so anyway, gentlemen, have a good night. Everybody stay healthy, wash your hands and we'll talk to you tomorrow either way. So come join us tomorrow night for assembly car radio. See you, everybody. Good night, everyone. <clears> Thank <throat>